Well, tonight I want to talk about evangelism. And I would like for you to turn with me to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 11th verse and the 12th verse and the 13th verse. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know, the evangelistic harvest is always urgent. The destiny of man and of nations is always being decided. I believe that we stand right now on the very edge of what could be Armageddon. What we're seeing in the Middle East is confusing, and yet we're seeing a general pattern. And we have the laser beams, chemical weapons, accurate delivery systems of nuclear and chemical weapons that could hit a football field with their so accurate, 4,000 or 5,000 miles away. If ever we needed to pray for the leaders of the world, it's tonight. We are meeting at a critical moment for this conference. I do not know whether this is God's moment in history for those climactic events of the sounding of the bells and all the pealing of the thunder and all the lightning of revelation. I don't know. This may be one of God's great springtimes when he's going to do a new thing. And it may start here tonight at the beginning of this great conference. But there seem to be periods of special urgency in history when it can be said with great relevance, the fields are white under harvest. And almost every newspaper and every book screams from its pages, the harvest is ripe. Dr. George Gallup believes that America is ripe for a spiritual harvest right now. His study shows that 50% of the unchurched can see a situation where they could consider becoming active church members. Four out of five of the unchurched want their children to have some kind of religious education. Two out of three pray, believe in God, believe in Jesus as the Son of God, and have deep religious roots. And Dr. Gallup is convinced with the right approach they can be reached. Never has the soil of the human heart and mind been better prepared than it is tonight. Never has the grain been thicker. Never have we had more efficient instruments in our hands to help us gather the harvest. Yet at a time when the harvest is the ripest in history, the church is often floundering in confusion, especially concerning evangelism. First, there is confusion in the church as to what evangelism means. Dr. George Hunter, who's sitting here, in his excellent book, The Contagious Congregation, says, quote, evangelism is a much misunderstood word capable of many possible meanings. Most people swear either by it or at it. And how true he is. Those of us like Oral Roberts and others who are evangelists know that. Some think of evangelism simply in terms of getting people into the church or persuading them to conform to a particular pattern of religious belief and behavior similar to their own. Today, there are many people who think of evangelism as social action and omit entirely the winning of people to a personal relationship with Christ. In recent years, many have rejected the biblical doctrine that men are individually sinners before God and will be held responsible for him at the judgment. Instead, they believe in a doctrine of collective sinfulness and the corporate guilt of society. There's a spreading universalism which has deadened our urgency that the Wesleys had and the Asburys had and East Stanley Jones had and others like them. There's been a change of emphasis in the church's task from one essentially spiritually to one essentially secular. This new evangelism leads many to reject the idea of conversion 
in its historical biblical meaning and the meaning historically held and preached and taught by the Methodist Church. The church, and I'm talking about all denominations now, needs to recover a biblical definition of evangelism. And it seems to me that we cannot improve on the definition of evangelism given to us by the Lausanne Covenant. Quote, evangelism is the proclamation of the historical biblical Christ as Savior and Lord with the view to persuading people to come to him personally and be reconciled to God. The results of evangelism include obedience to Christ, incorporation into his church, and responsible service in the world. The Bible does not use the word evangelism, but the verb form of the word appears often in the New Testament, which basically means to proclaim the good news and is used over 50 times. By using verbs to speak about evangelism, the Bible puts the stress on active communication. Canon Douglas Webster of the Church of England pointed out, quote, in the great majority of the 76 instances of the word gospel in the New Testament, the verb that goes with it is to preach. However, evangelism is never mere words isolated from the total witness of God's people. There is no dichotomy between redemptive evangelism and our social responsibility. They go together, they're partners. And we must, we must recognize that. Secondly, there is confusion concerning the motive for evangelism. Our first motive is the command of the command in chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. To fail to heed this command is deliberate disobedience. Three of the four gospels end with a commission to the church to evangelize the world. And the book of Acts begins with another similar commission. And Jesus repeated it five times. Our second motive for evangelism is the example set by the preaching of the apostles. An evangelistic objective was at the very heart of their proclamation. They said, for we cannot stop speaking of what we ourselves have heard and seen. Thirdly, in Paul's words, the love of Christ constrains us, he said. Constrained by his love, we seek to share the gospel with others. When I see the scene of the cross tonight and see it illustrated as we saw it so magnificently done a moment ago, I could not help but groan within as I thought back on that scene 2,000 years ago and all of a sudden there came a surge over me of the love and the compassion of Christ. And I remembered the words of D.T. Niles. I heard him say it. We're beggars telling other beggars how to find bread. The fourth motive for evangelism is the approaching judgment. Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In the solemn light of the day of judgment, man's greatest need is reconciliation to God. He commanded all men everywhere to repent, for he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. John the Baptist came preaching judgment. Jesus preached judgment. There is a day of accountability coming. And people do not seem to be aware of it. I believe the scriptures teach that people outside of Jesus Christ are lost. In Matthew 7, our Lord says to some men, depart from me. And here is final judgment. He again said, he that believeth not is condemned already. If we really believe that men are lost apart from Jesus Christ, it should become a burning incentive to evangelize with zeal and passion. The fifth motive for evangelism is compassion for the spiritual, moral, and social needs of men. Jesus had compassion on them is a phrase that is used over and over in the Gospels. He looked on men not only as separated from God by sin, but as sick bodies that needed his healing touch and empty stomachs that needed feeding and prejudiced hearts that needed his words. Thirdly, there is confusion also concerning the message of salvation. Many times when traveling internationally, we encounter the customs agent who says, have you anything to declare? Boy, some of them look at you with a glassy eye. And someday I'm going to surprise one of those fellows and I'm going to say, yes, 
I have to declare to you that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day, and I command you to repent and believe. But tragically, 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 many times the church doesn't have much to declare. At the time of the 1960 Olympics, a magazine carried a cartoon showing the runner from Marathon of the classic Greek story, carrying the message of victory. He came stumbling and gasping into the palace, fell prostrate before the king, and a puzzled blank look came on his face and he mumbled, I've forgotten the message. Any other message than the gospel of Jesus Christ is not evangelism. Call it something else. It may be good and fine and great. But Paul sums up the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now notice he said according to the scriptures. And I want to tell you, I believe that this book is the authoritative word of God. Now, fourthly, there's confusion concerning the strategy of the enemy in evangelism. To Jesus and the apostles, Satan was very real. He was called the prince of this world, the god of this age, the prince and power of the air. And names indicate something of his character and strategy. He was called deceiver, liar, murderer, accuser, tempter, destroyer, and many other names. And the evangelist and the work of evangelism is opposed on every hand by tremendous spiritual forces. When the seed of the gospel is being sown, he's always there sowing the tares. But more, he has the power to blind the minds of those whom we are seeking to evangelize. His strategy is to use deception, sometimes force, sometimes evil and error to destroy the effectiveness of the gospel. If we ignore the existence of Satan or our ignorance of his devices, then we fall into his clever trap. However, we have the glorious promise, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And fifthly, there is confusion also concerning the method of evangelism. Leighton Ford has listed six methods. I think there are probably a hundred methods of evangelism. You go to any part of the world and they use different methods. The method I use may not be the most effective method. We try to use a multiplicity of methods in our crusades. No one method will be right for every person in every situation at any given time. But some method of evangelism is certainly right for all people in all situations at all times. The Holy Spirit can take any method and use it to win souls. But our goal is nothing less than the penetration of the whole world. Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the world. The evangelization of the world does not mean that all men will respond, but that all men will be given an opportunity to hear. We all know the, that great statement by Wesley in 1784. You have nothing to do but to save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. Observe, it is not your business to preach so many times and to take care of this or that society, but to save as many souls as you can, to bring as many sinners as you possibly can to repentance, and with all your power to build them up in that holiness without which they'll never see the Lord. Let it be remembered that the Methodist Church began in the white heat of conversion and intense evangelistic energy. Let it be recalled tonight that the Methodist Church is an evangelistic movement. And let the decade of the 80s be the decade of evangelism led by the United Methodist Church. A decade of dynamic discipleship, implementing the General Board's comprehensive plan of evangelism, linking to the World Methodist Council's world evangelistic crusade. Let this be a decade when the great revival that many are praying for and many believe is on the way is going to sweep the Methodist church, and I believe it's happening right now. 
among lay and clergy alike, and I believe by the end of this decade, if God gives us the time, I believe the Methodist Church is going to be leading the way.